I, I think sometimes. So this morning, we want to, if I can just do this, I may read a, wh- a while because I've got some thoughts and, and that I've captured here and, and, and wrote down. And because when you talk about a, a Mother's Day, there's so many times in the Bible, there are some stories that we kind of read and we, we skip over. Because we think, well, you know what, this really doesn't pertain to me. It, 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 I just don't understand what God's saying. And, and so this morning, I picked um, three mothers' lives. And, and um, some of them, you will kind of recognize who they are. And some of them, uh, you may not. And there's some stories about this because it's not just a, about a mother. And so I want to start off by saying happy Mother's Day. And we are so glad for you that have come um, to be with your mother on, on this day to celebrate the, your children that are here and everything. And so I want to start off with a question that I think y'all can kind of answer. How many of you all here uh, have had or have in some point in your life a mother? Um, For those of you that don't, I don't know where you came from. (laughs) Because one of the things that we all have in common, whether our mother is still here or not, is we have time to really celebrate uh, our mother. Now, let me say this, that mothers have impacted our lives for better or for worse. And sometimes when we when we look at this, we also can understand that there are some times that we've had joy, and for some of us that every once in a while needed a little bit of pain, it, it was called correction, um, by, it could, could have been called by the Board of Education, or it could have been called by the switch of justice. Um, I learned early in life that when your mother sent you out to get a switch, she was not talking about the thing that you have on the wall to turn the lights on and off. Um, She didn't appreciate it when she said, I need you to go get the switch, and I went to the switch on the wall and I turned it off, and I said, I won't move but I found out that if I made my mom laugh she would forget what she was going to do to me okay the rest of the rest of my brothers and sisters did not learn that okay they they just learned that no oh well let's get it I also learned that what kind of switch to get the best kind of switch to get is one that's on a dead tree or bush. And when I would bring it into her, she would say, why are you giving me this dead switch? And I said, because you told me that by the time I was, you were done with me, I was going to be dead. So I thought me and the switch could relate. She didn't agree with that judge sense. So then it was, you had to go get a switch that had life in it, right? And I said, you know, that's really not fair. Why in the world would you kill this bush just because you don't like me? And, and so, but can I tell you something? I got my sense of humor from my mother. And so I was the one that, well, and then my sister later on, my younger sister, we were the ones that, remember when they say that when you are, growing up and kind of the discipline problem that when you have children, it's going to come around. 
Well, it did for my mother. And, and so that's what she got. But listen, we need to understand that this lessons that we want to draw from this morning are not just from mothers who have, who have given birth. And, and this lesson isn't just for mothers that have given birth. The message this morning is for every one of us because there's some principles that God is trying to tell us out of the lives of these three mothers. One of the greatest lessons that I think that we could all learn is about grace. And really, what is grace? We, we talk about it so much that sometimes I, I think we've kind of watered down an understanding, really, of what grace is. But when we begin to understand about as we celebrate mothers, there's something that we've got to also understand, and that is in being a mother, there's pain involved. And sometimes we, we forget about that pain because some of the pain that a mother feels is not just superficial pain. It's a very deep pain. And when we, you begin to look at it, it's kind of kind of hard because when you when you go to the store and you look you're trying to find a card to give to to your mother it seems that every one of those hallmark cards want to talk about how that the love of a mother can't not be compared to that that's the greatest love that there ever is but you don't really find a lot of Hallmark cards that talk about the pain of a mother. Think about it for just a moment. Let's go all the way back to the very beginning with a woman by the name of Eve, created, and God told them to be fruitful and multiply. Remember the joy as a mother that you had when someone told you that you were going to be pregnant with your child. And just how bubbly and everything that you were feeling. I think that Eve felt that too. And then the Bible doesn't tell us how many children that she really had, but it does define Two sons, Cain and Abel. And you think about the love that that mother had for both of those children. But also think about this. She was the first mother that had to bury her child. And how would you like to be a mother who has to bury your child that was killed by their brother, your son. And you think about, you know, all of this, and you feel that you, you understand the joy that she had as, as, as becoming a mother, but now all of a sudden, all of that joy seems to be just overwhelmed by the pain that she's feeling. And the Bible doesn't tell us much about it. But I don't think we really need a whole lot of explanation just to understand the pain. And then think about a young lady who is engaged to be married, getting ready for the greatest day in her life. And all of a sudden, she gets the news that she's with child. And there's all this excitement. But then she realizes, hold on, how can this be? When the angel tells Mary that you're with child, 
And she says, how can this be? I have never known a man. But don't you understand that your child and his father is God? There's this pain of, of being ostracized from civilization and everybody around her because everybody's going to think bad of her because she's pregnant and she's not married. But yes, she's, she's bearing a child that's going to be the Messiah, the Savior. And all of the joy, but yet the pain that she's feeling. But yet she gets to travel. You think about how proud you are of your children. Do you ever think of how proud Mary was as she traveled with her son Jesus? See, he was the one that took care of her when Joseph died because he was the man of the family. We don't know at what age that Joseph died, but we know it was sometime between the age of 12 and 30. We have no idea how long Jesus was the one that had to be the provider for the household. And yet, his mother traveled with him, watching him. Think about it, how proud you would be as you're, as you're watching your son deliver some words and everybody just flocking to him. Or watching your son heal a blind man, raise someone from the dead, heal everybody of all of these different diseases and just showing the kind of love that you wish that everybody else could show and manifest. And here she is. She is so excited. I am the mother. I'm the mother of the Messiah. But think about the pain that she felt as her son is being scourged. The skin is ripped away to a point where you, he's not even recognizable. And then to stand at the foot of the cross and watch him die. You see, with being a mother and with all of us, it is the same, ladies and gentlemen. We wish that our whole life could be nothing but joy failing to realize that with joy comes pain. And sometimes we forget about these things. And so as Mary was standing there and just watching, she began to realize that there is great joy and there is deep pain. And a mother, when she's having a child, and in that delivery, it's always been said that if a, if a woman had a child first and a man had a child second, every family would only have three children because after the first one, a man would never, ever have a second one. As strong as they may be, God did not make us strong in that case. The pain of childbirth and there are so many times when they don't tell you that when you go to a birthing class and you're having the child, they don't tell you that the pain doesn't end there, that the pain will continue through your life because there's different types of pain that is going to be there. And that that pain is not over when you're done pushing. Because there's still some things that are going on. And may I say this to you, that labor for your children is lifelong. And unfortunately, they don't have an epidural that they can give you some time to erase the pain that you feel through life. You see, because every mother's heart, every mother's heart is both full and broken at the same time and feeling of both. And so we 
look at some of these things and I look out there and I see some of you nodding, saying, yeah, that's right. Because we don't get to experience everything that we would like sometimes. Sometimes it's not the best. But let me say this to, to you, that I challenge you just as a mother gives us an example of, and that is this, that we all have to experience love and grace at the same time with an open hand. There are times, I know, our children will disappoint us. They're going to make some decisions that we're not going to like. And sometimes those are going to be some very, very difficult decisions. But yet there are times we're going to have to extend grace with an open hand. And why do I say all of this? Because that's God. That's God. God is extending at the same time, open hand of love and grace because there are times that we're not always going to do what it is to please God. There are going to be sometimes we're going to do things to please self. But may I say this to you, that even in those times when you do things that will come to a point of not pleasing your mother, she's still going to love you. And she's going to extend grace to you just like he would. But sometimes what we've got to do and what we've got to learn is we've got to take our children. And we need to understand that we can't just hold on to them with a tight fist. That sometimes we're going to have to release them into the hands of the Father. And let him do his thing. And sometimes that can be painful because the only way that you can really keep holding on to your children is you've got to keep letting go but hold on tighter to God. Because when you look at the scriptures, in the three mothers that I picked for this sermon this morning, these three mothers would not be, their story would not be out on Instagram. It wouldn't have a lot of followers. As a matter of fact, sometimes their names are not even mentioned, like the first one. The first one was a lady by the name of Jochebed. And you've got to go all the way back into the book of Exodus to find this mother. And when you begin to read in Exodus chapter 2, in verse number 1, it just basically says, now a man from the family of Levi married a Levite woman. Doesn't even give her name of who she is. And you begin to start reading, and you keep reading, and you're reading, and you're reading. And not until you get into Exodus chapter 4 does it even mention her name. But she was a very, very, very famous person. You see, because Jochebed was a mother who delivered a very healthy son. But in the period of time that she was, deliver- was delivering this son, there were some circumstances that forced her to give up her son. And so what had happened was the Pharaoh, at the time that Jochebed had her first healthy son, Pharaoh had passed a decree that every 
Israelite son who was born was to be killed. How would you like to have been a mother giving birth to a healthy son, holding him in your arms, and knowing that this son is going to die if anybody finds out? And so Jochebed decided that what she would do is as she listened to her son cry and take that first breath, she was going to have to release him in order of hoping that he would, that he would live. Or she could risk her life by keeping him. Or she could risk the life of her whole family if she had kept the son. That's a decision that another, a mother should never have to make. But she's having to make this decision. She was also putting her other children, her, uh, her older children's lives. Or she could let him go. So what does she do? Jochebed builds a little, like, boat. And she puts her son in the boat and puts it in the water. And this is on the Nile River. Praying, God, you take care of him. Well, what did God do? At that moment of time, Pharaoh's daughter came down the river or by the river, found this baby, and Moses' sister happened to be right there. And she appears and she says, Hey, they look, it was an Israelite child. And Moses' sister, which later on, if you go back and look, the Bible says she was a prophet in the, the, uh, when Moses was leading the children from Egypt to the promised land. So what did she do? She recommends to Pharaoh's daughter, hey, I think I might know a Hebrew woman who might be able to raise that child. And I, I think she, would, I think she would, would be up to the task. And so Pharaoh's daughter says, go ask her. Sure enough, Pharaoh's daughter or, or Moses' sister goes to her mother, Jochebed, and say, hey, Pharaoh's daughter wants to know if you'll come and raise this child. Oh, what do you think? A mother who had a child and had to give that child up to save that child's life is now given the opportunity of once again raising that child. She nursed that child up until the age of two and then had to take and give that child up to be raised by Pharaoh's daughter and in his home. Given and taken away. Given and taken away. And when we begin to look at this, we begin to understand something because she called him Moses. Moses meant saved from the water or found in the water. 
And that's how he got his name. His mother even gave him the name. And she began to raise him. In Exodus chapter 2, verses 9 and 10, we already alluded to these. It said, so the woman, she took the, or Pharaoh's daughter said to her, take this child and nurse him for me, and I will pay you wages. How many of you all would have been loved to have been paid money for raising your children? I mean, think about it for a minute. You're not just a mother. You're a babysitter. You're a doctor. You're a lawyer. You're a judge. You, you get to also be the taxi cab driver. You get to be the teacher. Uh, there's all kinds of other things that you get to be taught. And now, actually, if, if you took all of the jobs that you were having to do and put them all together and give yourself a salary, you could have paid their education and everything else for the rest of their life. But it doesn't work that way. So what happened? Take this. So the woman took the baby and she nursed him. When the child grew older, she brought him to Pharaoh's daughter and he became her son. She named him Moses because she said, I drew him out of the water. And so what ends up happening? Pharaoh's Pharaoh's daughter begins to do this. And you think about it for a minute. She had a son. She had to give up. She received him back. Then she had to give him up again. There are some times that we need to understand something. As much as we don't like it, there are sometimes we have to realize that circumstances are out of our control. And sometimes we have to do some things that are painful. And we can't do anything about it. And you think about it for a minute. What are some of the things that you've had to give up that was out of your control? For some of you, like we were married in 1972 and we were expecting our first child. And she wasn't supposed to be here. I'm sorry. No, we got married in 72, yes. Uh, uh, yeah, I need to clarify that. Because I always, we, we meet people, we meet people and, and they say, how long have you been married? And uh, I'll say 52, 52 years. And they'll say, well, how old are you? And I tell them 17. <laughs> you know, I'll, t I'll tell them 70. Man, you got married young. Yo, I was 18. Well, how old was your wife? And I watched the look on their face when I say 16. Because all of a sudden it starts this gears rolling. Oh, she must have been pregnant. No, she wasn't. We were just two young kids in love. And um, thinking that we couldn't stay away from each other. And so we learned real quick, life is rough at 18 and 16 and married, man. But we learned a little bit rougher when we were expecting our first child in 19 and 74. She wasn't supposed to be born until September, I think, I think late, late August, early September. All during the pregnancy, my wife is having complications. She's gaining weight, and they don't know why. It got to the point where uh, when her mother came to see her uh, after all the complications and everything, her mom didn't even recognize who she was. She was so swollen. 
with the fluids. We were told, cut out the, the salts. You quit, quit doing this, quit doing that. And they missed what was wrong. She was seven and a half months. We were home. And I'll never forget the night I was watching Johnny Carson as my wife was laying on the couch asleep. The doctor had given her a a pain pill and had knocked her out and she's laying there on the couch. My wife, uh, at the age of 12, had her first seizure. And so I kind of knew about what this was and stuff, but I'd never seen it until that night when she got up and said, uh, I, I think it's okay, I can go to bed now, I'm feeling better. We had a townhouse and our bedroom was upstairs. I was in the recliner watching the TV and watching her when all of a sudden I see the seizure. I have no idea what to do. I always heard was make sure they don't swallow their tongue and I'm looking for something to put in her mouth to keep her from swallowing your tongue. And like an idiot, don't ever do this. Don't ever put your fingers in their mouth because they clamp. And they clamp hard. And I, I learned that lesson. I still have my fingers, though, with, with no uh, things. I called the life squad, and, and then I called the doctor. And I said, I really don't care if you show up or not. It doesn't really matter. My wife has had a seizure and we're sending her to the hospital and whoever's there uh, is going to take care. We'll we'll meet you there. Well, they did and she was diagnosed with eclampsia, uh, toxemia. toxemia. Um, It was in the time of of a... um, when they were just coming out with the fetal heart monitors and they were still in training. And I never will forget, um, as they threw me out of the room and took her to the operating room, they came back and they said, uh, uh, we're sorry we couldn't save the baby. We, um, We almost lost her. Um, and they were going to decide for themselves uh, that they were going to tie her tubes without asking anyone. They didn't. They told us that we would never, ever have children, that she should never get pregnant again. So for, uh, that was in July of 1974, In December of 1975, uh, God proved them wrong. We were blessed with our first son. Um, But it was difficult because I'm in Maryland and I I had to send her back to Ohio where I trusted the doctors. They had told her that her kidneys were shot. They would never be the same. And within about six to seven months, everything was fine. She got pregnant with the first. Pregnant in 1978, we delivered our second son. And uh, we said, that we're done. We're done. That's it. But God wasn't. And we were blessed with a daughter in 1984. And so sometimes... Things aren't always the way that you would like them to go. And sometimes you give up to gain something else. So I have a child. I have a daughter I, I only got to see laying there motionless. We named her uh, Robin. And um, one day... One day we'll see her, but not as a child. We'll see her as who 
God had planned for her to be. And so the verse that I've learned is in Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 to 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. And do not rely on your own understanding. In all your ways, know him. And he will make your path straight. I've learned, just as Jochebed learned, that there are some times you have to give up in order to gain. And then God will give, and sometimes you will release, and God will give more. Jochebed is a mother that gave us this lesson and this story. That yes, a mother but a lesson from God that he wants us to learn. You see, because in Isaiah chapter 55, verses 8 and 9, it's a very familiar scripture, for my thoughts are not your thoughts. My ways and your ways are not always my ways. This is the Lord's declaration. For as heaven is higher than earth, so my ways are higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. And so what Jochebed leaves with us in in this first point is this. Where do you need to surrender control to God in your life? As mothers, as individuals, is there something that you're hanging on to that you need to release and let him have control on? The second one, is found in 1 Kings chapter 17. There was a little widow from Zarephath. And there was the widow and she had a son. And there was a prophet by the name of Elijah. And Elijah had been running from Jezebel. And he's hiding out by the stream with water. The problem was, He didn't have any food, nothing to make anything. And so God tells Joshua or or Elijah, I need you to go to this widow over here by the name of Seraphath. And he says, here, what you're going to do, or go to this place called Seraphath, and you're going to find this widow. And what you're going to find is that God has already told this widow to feed you. Sure enough, Elijah arrives. He asks the ladies for water. And what does she do? She goes and gets the water and brings it to him. And he says, okay, can, can you give me something to eat? Give me some bread. And she says, sir, I wish I could. But you see, I've only got enough, I've only got enough grain to make one loaf of bread. Just enough to feed me and my son. This was going to be our last meal. You see, there was a famine in the land. And she said, we don't have anything left. And we're going to eat this meal. And then we're going to die. 1 Kings chapter 17 and verse number 12. It says, as surely as the Lord, the Lord your God lives, I don't have any bread, only a handful of flour in a jar and a little olive oil and a jug. I'm gathering a few sticks to take home and make a meal for myself, my son, that we may eat it and we may die. It's a grim situation for a mother, knowing that you have, you've only got one last meal, nothing else. You're going to feed your child and you're going to die, you and your child, together. But what happens? Elijah responds responds in verses 13 and 14 out of 1 King and uh, 17. And he tells her, he says, don't be afraid. Go home and, and, and do as you have said. But here's what I want you to do. First, I want you to make just a small loaf of bread for me from what you have and then I want you to bring it to me. Hold on. Dude, I don't even know you. 
and you're asking me to go bake you this small loaf of bread and bring it to you and we're not going to have anything to eat? Really? Does it look like I was born yesterday? But he says, listen, for this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says, the jar of flour will not be used up and the jug of oil will not run dry until the day the Lord sends the rain on the land. Until it rains again, you're going to go to that, that jar that has some flour and that jug that has some oil and you're going to get you some flour and you're going to get you some oil and you're going to make you some bread and guess what? When you come back for the next meal, you're going to have the same oil, you're going to have the same uh, flour and guess what you're going to do? You're going to eat some more bread and you're going to keep doing this until God opens up the heaven and brings out the rain to bless you. So the widow does exactly what uh, God had instructed Moses or Elijah to do. I'm stuck with Moses and Jochebed. And it just keeps miraculously flowing, okay? Don't know how long this went on and, every, and everything, but eventually the widow's son dies. And when he does, Elijah cries out to God. Elijah does. Here is a mother, God, that gave up everything for me. And now her son is dead. God, why? Why? There are some things that happen, ladies and gentlemen, that we don't have reasons for. But I know one thing. Elijah cried out to God. And it's then that when he does, that all of a sudden God brings life back into that son. And here he comes back to life again. And in verse number 24, the widow says this, now I know, now I know that you are a man of God and that the word of the Lord from your mouth is the truth. She, he had, she had been doing stuff that he had been telling her to do all along, but now all of a sudden she says, now I know that you are one from God. Maybe she had had the doubts in all of these things, but she learned real quick. Let me finish with number three. A story that you're well known by a lady by the name of Bathsheba. You see, Bathsheba not only became a mother, but she also experienced the pain of a mother. Bathsheba was a, a woman who didn't have any children, but she was married to Uriah. Expecting, just like any mother or any woman, married, I'm going to have children. But Uriah is constantly out on the battlefield, out on the battlefield, out on the battlefield. And what ends up happening is here is Bathsheba minding her own business. And then all of a sudden, she is caught up by a guy by the name of David, who we always remember the little boy, the little boy that killed the giant with the stone. But this little boy 
that killed the giant with the stone became a man that was that had power and that power went to his head and so what ends up happening Bathsheba gets caught up in this web of David's power not only of David's power David is married Bathsheba is married And David uses his power to make her commit adultery. You see, because in that time, in in that civilization, if the king came and demanded something from you as a woman, ladies, you had to, you had no choice. You were die or give it up. And unfortunately, it is not right. But she's caught up in all of this. Not only is she caught up with the the adultery, she's also caught up because now she's married or she's going to have a child with the guy that had her husband commit or murdered and also trying to cover up the murder. And she's caught in all of this. And she's going to have a son from David. And in Samuel chapter 11 and chapter 12, doesn't tell us much about what's happened. But what it does tell us is this, is that God was very displeased with David and his actions. The little boy who killed the who killed Goliath, who has now become a man that God is displeased with as the king. The child is born, and the child is sick. David is wailing, he's crying, he's pleading with God, he's pleading with God, he's pleading with God. The baby dies. Bathsheba's hurting. God, why? Why? She received, but she had to give up. But that's not the end of the story. Bathsheba had another son. And Bathsheba, Bathsheba is now in the lineage of Christ. She had a son by the name of Solomon. And you know the rest of the story. Her son became the greatest king of all times. The wisest man of ever. And in Romans chapter 8 and verse 28, which is also my verse, And it says, and we know that in all things God works for the good for those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. In Genesis chapter 50, in verse number 20, Joseph, remember, got sold into slavery by his sons. And here's, or his brothers, look at what he said. You planned evil against me. God planned it for good to bring about the present result, the survival of many people. Sometimes we need to understand things, and that is this. Bathsheba, Bathsheba was a living story of redemption. She got caught up in a lot of stuff, but God redeemed her. And she was blessed with the child of all childs. And sometimes we need to understand 
that enough? What is enough? I think that the, if I was to ask a mother or mothers, what do you really want for Mother's Day? I don't think it's flowers. I don't think it's a card. I think if I really was to ask, what would you really want as a mother? Here's what I think I would get. I would really like to see the world that is broken fixed. Because I sure don't want my children to go through what I see is on the horizon. I've watched my kids' hearts be broken. And I sure wish they could be mended. Or, you know what? I wish I could just go back and just hold them tight and never let them go. But you can't. And none of us can. But in that space, that space, where every heart of a mother and every heart of all of us is broken, there's only one big enough to fill that space that's empty. His name is Jesus. And that's who wants to fill that. You see, because in our lives as mothers, in our lives as individuals, there's only one person big enough to mend that crack. And that's Jesus. God says this, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. And that is, that is God's promise to every one of you as mothers today. That in those moments when you feel like, I wish I could just be stronger for my kids. I just wish I could just help them in some way. God says, I got you. I got you. You see, with all of the messes of life and everything else that it brings, what sometimes we've got to learn is this. There are sometimes we've got to release our children and let God have them. Because he's the only one that can control everything. And just say, Lord, I learned a long time ago. I shared with you about our daughter. Our daughter, uh, my wife has a, uh, it's called juvenile myoclonic uh, epilepsy, which is uh, epilepsy, which you get basically when you're going through um, puberty. Um, bodies changing and everything's messed up and stuff. It, it, it alters some things and you get it. And so uh, she had her first seizure at 12 and her father found her uh, in the bathtub and she had already had the seizure. And, and so it was like, uh, you're 18. Do you really think that you can handle this? It was really hard for them to turn her loose too, for a lot of reasons. So when we were blessed with our daughter in 1984, uh, we started noticing some things that were going on and some things that were happening and um, we just didn't know 
what it was until we found out that she would come, she always wanted dark in her room. And my wife likes everything bright. So she would come out of her room upstairs and come downstairs to eat breakfast before she would go to school and the lights would be on and they would be really bright and, and she would just kind of zone out for just a short period of time of that adjustment. She was finally diagnosed uh, with epilepsy also, but the problem was they made the assumption that she had the same type of epilepsy that my wife had, which was absolutely wrong. Um, For a few years, we were unaware that there was a cyst in her brain that was growing and filling up with uh, uh, spinal fluid. To eventually that cyst became so enlarged and the fluid had been in there so long that it had now coagulated. And that cyst now rolled over on top of the canal that went into the spinal column. And so all of this fluid that should be going into your spinal column was now being in your brain. And so she had hydroencephalus. Your brain can expand only so far with your skull. She was complaining of headaches and massive headaches and hurting immensely. We took her to a doctor. She had been seeing doctors and they hadn't been able to figure it out. We went to a little doctor over in Oxford, not Cincinnati, not Dayton, not John Hopkins, little doctor over in uh, Oxford. Late on a Friday night, we were supposed to travel that weekend. We were leaving on Saturday to go to visit my son in uh, Florida because we had our two grandsons that had stayed, well, they had gone home, and we were going to fly. And this doctor said, I don't know what's wrong, but there's something wrong. He said, uh, I know that they're not in right now. They've, everybody's gone home, but they owe me a favor. I need to have them come back in and do an MRI, an MRI or a CAT scan. Same. A CT. Okay. Sometimes I don't get them right. I have to get the stories right. Did the CT. We're sitting there waiting, and we see the doctor go by. And he's in there for a while, and then he comes in. And he says, uh, I've already called children's. They're waiting for her. We're taking her there right now. Um, She has a cyst in the brain that needs a mass there that they need to look at and see what they're going to do. We're in the room upstairs, and I left my wife in that room, and I went over to another room where there wasn't anybody. You see, because I hadn't told you the rest of the story. My wife had lost her mother. Her, her mom was not always her best friend uh, as she was going through some trying to uh, sprout her wings, if I could say, in her teenage years. But after we had gotten married, she had become very close to her mom. And she had lost her, she had lost her friend. We prayed and she got pregnant. For all nine months, we didn't ask for the sex of the child. We didn't know, she knew. She said, I've got a daughter. And everybody told me, what happens if it's a boy? And I said, I'm leaving home. Because you'll kill me. I've already got two sons. She needed a daughter. And what did God give her? A daughter. This was on her 15th birthday, right? Or 14th. 
14th birthday when we found this out. I went into that room and I prayed. God, you gave her, her. Don't take her. Let her live. I told my wife everything was going to be okay. It's going to be okay. Why? Because I believe that he, it's going to be okay. So my daughter today is the wife of a pastor. Sometimes you have to release in order to gain. Hard lessons. But may I say to you as I cry, oh, I'm glad I'm old. <laughs> but may I say to you this morning, when do we learn enough is enough? That God, I'm willing to release these things out of my life that I can't control and give them to you. What better time than on Mother's Day to say, Lord, here I am, I'm all yours. My kids, they're all yours. My grandkids, they're all yours. Everything that I have, it's all yours. It's all yours. I can't control it, but you can. And I trust you. I trust you. It may not always turn out the way I want it to turn out, but it'll be okay. It'll be okay. This morning, I hope and pray you will. So...